Hey folks, my name is Colin McCluskey. I'm an EM intensivist from Cleveland, Ohio. And half my time I spend in the cardiothoracic ICU where I get to play around with LVADs, which is pretty great. And what I want to chat about you today is how to troubleshoot the low flow LVAD. Nicely, this isn't very difficult. You only need to know four words. LVADs are preload dependent and afterload sensitive. Once you figure uh, that out and understand that physiology, trying to troubleshoot the low flow LVAD becomes pretty straightforward. Once again, you're never alone when an LVAD patient comes in. You may be intimidated by the fact that they have a very expensive piece of metal in their chest. However, before we put that piece of metal in someone's chest, it takes a village. And every VAD person will have a VAD coordinator that they have the number to. I would enlist that person's help as soon as possible. And the reason for this is that VAD coordinator can, one, help you troubleshoot the device, but can also provide pertinent historical information on how that patient's been doing in the outpatient setting if they're coming into the ED. Have they been struggling with their anticoagulation? Have they had other problems with their heart failure? And it can really give you some real good information to get a start as you're trying to troubleshoot the human in front of you. So for the uninitiated, an LVAD really has internal and external components. The internal components are a magnetically levitated centrifugal flow device that's cored into the LV apex. This accepts blood from the LV chamber and then shoots it through that cannula into the ascending aorta. Now, the power source to this pump is called the drive line, and there's both a pump cable and a modular cable that then connect it to the controller. This is tunneled from the chest out of the abdomen, and the controller kind of ends up on the patient's hip. All right. The controller will be your point of access to the LVAD. Now, don't worry. There's nothing you can touch on the controller to turn the device off, but it can provide you with a wealth of information, namely the flow the speed, the power, and then any alarms. Now, you should know that the only thing we set on LVADs is the speed. The flow is then dependent on the preload. This is a preload dependent device. It is gonna spin at around 5,000 RPMs and will generate a flow only to that which is given by the preload returning to the left ventricle. 5,000 RPMs and there's a distributive shock state like sepsis, or the patient's hypovolemic or has been bleeding, you're gonna have a low preload to the LV core. And as a result, you're gonna have low flow actually pumping through that device. So they are preload dependent. These are not devices that can augment their preload. They are only gonna be able to pump what is provided to them from the right side of the heart. But they're also afterload sensitive. Still, 5,000 RPMs. And to be honest, they've been programmed to have pretty consistent flows if the patient's mean arterial pressure is between 65 and 85. However, once you get above 85, especially if you're in triple digits above 100, you're going to see the performance of this pump, as far as the flows it can generate, drop off considerably. So these are preload dependent and afterload sensitive devices. That's all. That's it. Now let's talk about some of the pathologies that can bring out perturbations based on that physiology. The first is the any infection. Now, infection is the number one cause of late-term complications after LVAD placement, late being after six months of implant. Now, as I said before, you have a drive line that connects a metal device in the patient's chest but emanates out through their stomach. A unique illness that you can get is a drive line infection. That's where gram-positive organisms from the skin kind of burrow in along that drive line and can infect the entire pump. This can lead to a distributive shock in a septic state. And nicely, it'll be something that resolves with empiric antibiotics. You're never bad off to start the house red and house wine of, of house red and house white of antimicrobials, which is vancomycin and piperazole and tazobactam. But some of these, if they have abscess formation, may need surgical consideration. The second com most common reason folks will have low flow LVADs is the fact that they're bleeding. Like the trauma patient, a low flow LVAD is bleeding until proven otherwise, unless there's an obvious grody driveline infection. Now, this is for two reasons. The first of which is that these folks are therapeutically anticoagulated. They're on warfarin, usually with INR goals between two and three. However, if you've taken care of anyone on warfarin, you know that sometimes that INR can drift all over the place. 
and you can have spontaneous bleeding. The number one source of bleeding in the LVAD patient is the GI tract. Now, how do you resuscitate the bleeding LVAD? The same way you resuscitate any bleeding patient. You obtain source control. Maybe that's a GI consult if they have GI bleeding. And you also can give blood products, or you can give some vitamin K antagonists, although we'll talk about PCCs in some special situations later on. However, these folks are also heart failure patients. They're on a boatload of diuretics. If possible, with outpatient manipulation of their diuretic dose, they're now a potato chip and are really dry. So just because they're low flow and they look hypovolemic, it's bleeding until proven otherwise, but they otherwise could be over diuresis. The last preload dependent state that we'll talk about is arrhythmia. Now you may think, they have a pump for the left heart. If anything, they're gonna tolerate arrhythmia better than me, and you'd be right. If you go into VTAC or me, we're gonna have a bad time pretty, in a pretty short uh, span of time. However, the LVAD patient will probably do pretty well for a while until the RV fails. So the RV is unprotected by the LVAD. So if you have a malignant arrhythmia, eventually, the bell will toll for the RV, it'll fail to get the preload over to the LV, and then you're going to have low flow. So anyone who has VTAC or any other malignant arrhythmia that's hemodynamically significant, I'm going to treat rather aggressively. My agent of choice in the CTICU is amiodarone with both boluses and an infusion. Now, if it gets really intense and you need to cardiovert or defibrillate this human, that's perfectly okay. We use an anterior posterior pad placement so you don't involve the device within that impulse. And this has been proven safe. The three preload dependent pathologies that can give you low flow, infection, hypovolemia, which we presume is hemorrhage until proven otherwise, and arrhythmia that really leads to RV failure. Let's talk about afterload sensitive pathologies. Now, as I said, all these folks are anticoagulated and for good reason. Anytime blood hits a artificial interface, it's going to become activated and prothrombotic. And this can happen on the rotors of that centrifugal flow device. So if you have somebody who's not therapeutically anticoagulated, you're going to get small blood clots on those rotors. Those will propagate. The way you can figure out if pump thrombosis is the cause of the low flow is both a clinical exam and looking at the controller. The clinical exam is going to be consistent with signs of hemolysis. They may have what they believe is hematuria or T-colored urine. And if you got labs and your LDH was sky high, say over 600, that'd be something that's potentially concerning. However, what I look for when I look at the controller is their power. Remember, we're have, we just plug in that speed at 5,000 RPMs. However, if there's added weight to the rotor because of aggregate clot and thrombosis, the power required to actually spin that 5,000 times is going to be elevated. So low flow plus high power, and in the context of hematuria or elevated LDH, subtherapeutic INRs, that's pump thrombosis until proven otherwise. How are you going to treat this? Systemic anticoagulation with a heparin infusion will never be the wrong choice. More like intense things such as TPA can be left to the pericode situation. Some of these folks will do just fine with your IV heparin but some will need to have the device explanted and replaced if the thrombosis is too severe. The last afterload sensitive pathology we'll talk about is systemic hypertension. As I said before, this pump is really good and performs pretty evenly over a map from 65 to 85. But once you go above that, maps in the 100s, you're gonna see the performance drop considerably. Now these folks have heart failure. Generally, that's a higher SVR state. So they're on a variety of medications to lower the SVR. Now, emergently, my favorites are either of the quick-acting peripheral calcium channel blockers. Nicardipine is pretty ubiquitous. If you have flavidipine, it's even faster and can work. I'm not against the nitrates either. Nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, anything to get that map between the 65 and 85 range to improve performance. Now, the one thing you should be aware of is if they have a neurosymptom plus hypertension, I get very worried about strokes in these humans. Two reasons. They could have embolic strokes from the device itself, and they're anticoagulated, so they can have hemorrhage. So this is something that you should definitely consider in your differential if they're hypertensive and altered. What about the crashing LVAD? Now you know when someone comes in with low flow, you certainly have an approach. It could be a preload-dependent pathology. 
or an afterload sensitive one. But what about the a person who's in true extremis? What can you do? It really depends on if the pump's working or not. If you can auscultate the hum of an LVAD pump, just resuscitate based on what pathology you think is driving it. Doing external chest compressions is not going to improve the flow over a working LVAD, even if it's um, not getting the preload or it's facing too much afterload. Further, if you do need to do compressions because the pump isn't working, there's not a green light on, you can't hear it, compressions are safe. A study that looked at folks who had gotten chest compressions with an LVAD and survived found that there was no device dislodgement or any mechanical compli complication of delivering that care. One thing to think about, if you really think it's pump thrombosis, some folks will say this is okay to TPA. They're a dead patient with an LVAD. I think it's probably going to be the better part of Valor to sell out for them. But depending upon the VAD coordinator and the type of device they had, that might not be universal. universal. Um, so LVADs, pretty simple. Only four words. They're preload dependent and afterload sensitive. The preload pathologies you need to think about are infection, especially of that driveline, hypovolemia, which is presumed to be hemorrhage, but could be over diuresis, and then arrhythmia that leads to right heart failure. Afterload sensitive conditions include both pul pul uh, pump thrombosis, which will have signs of hemolysis on your exam, and then high power on the controller, and also systemic hypertension. If the pump's working and they're um, in cardiac arrest, resuscitate based on what I've chatted about today. If the pump's not working, go to your basic ACLS and hope for the best. So that was low flow LVAD in about 10 to 12 minutes. Back to you, Haney. Thanks.